School Transportation Nation. Tony Corbin here. We're glad you made it to the podcast. This is brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. Propane, the energy for everyone. And Zenobi, making clean power accessible. In just a little bit, our own Taylor Ekbatani. Taylor, hello. Hello. Hi. Great to be on. Who are you talking with, Taylor? The audience wants to know. Yeah, our September cover star, Ron Johnson, the director of support operations for Indian Prairie School District number 204 in Illinois. So good conversation coming up. Nice. And I know when talking to Ron, he says he has his Sharpie ready to sign the front cover of anyone's magazine who might want one. So we'll have to get him out, maybe to the TSD conference uh, in November. It it might be a good place, right? Maybe to, to get him to sign autographs. Yeah, we do talk about transporting students with special needs in our interview. So would be good to have him out there. All right. We'll see if we can make that happen. Mr. Ryan Gray was with us as well. Ryan, good to see you, sir. Good to be seen. Thank you, Nation. It's great to be with you as always. Awesome. So we are going to be talking top headlines this week. September issue is out for everyone to enjoy on the STN website. The TSD conference is about two months away. We also have the uh, NAPT conference coming up in Oklahoma City. So we'll be out there with a booth uh, heading out the magazines. So uh, we'll have our September and October issues since that's happening in October. But uh, guys, you know, we got some exciting stuff. Before we get to those headlines, we have a quick message. Did you know that school buses fueled by propane can help you reduce emissions in your community while saving money? Propane school buses have a lower average carbon intensity than electric school buses over their lifetime by more than half. And they emit up to 96% less nitrogen oxide than diesel buses. All of this from fleets with the lowest total cost of ownership. It's no wonder propane is the most widely used alternative fuel in the school bus industry. Learn more at betterourbuses.com. That's betterourbuses.com. All right, Ryan, let's dive into the headlines. What do you got for us this week? Well, uh, NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, has its attention uh, finally focused on back to school, just like we do, Tony. Uh, So lots of news stories uh, that we've been looking at over the last uh, several weeks now. Uh, nationwide. It's been a a pretty rough uh, go uh, for a lot of school districts out there and uh, really hearing a lot and reading a lot about the driver shortage. So there were some some stats or some surveys over the past year that indicated that uh, much of the uh, driver shortage was alleviating those pressures. Uh, But certainly seeing that quoted a lot, Tony, in in articles, uh, a lot of articles that are that are talking about the driver shortage uh, and how that's impacting service. Uh, Parents are not happy. Uh, I know recently we uh, on our multimedia section at stnonline.com, we had a a link to a YouTube video uh, that was created by a group of school children in Jefferson County Public Schools, Kentucky. So that's Louisville. Obviously, last year, and a lot of you will remember that uh, Louisville, Jefferson County Public Schools there had some really big issues with the new uh, AI enabled uh, routing software that they had implemented uh, that uh, didn't take into consideration real world uh, scenarios, um, traffic, um, weather, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, the, 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 the challenges that, that you folks see all the time with routing. Uh, and so uh, they had to actually cancel about a week of school uh, last year. So that really, uh, Got things uh, into a, a sense of upheaval, uh, so some some uh, improvements were made, uh, some in-house um, routing. Uh, but as we see, there's still some challenges. They actually cut some non-essential transportation, so some general ed and some some magnet schools and some other special programs that uh, where transportation is not required. Uh, they are looking to bring some of that back, but as this uh, video from these school children, it's a, it's a rap video, uh, that they, they ask the question, where's my bus at? 
uh, and unfortunately, uh, seeing a lot of that, uh, which has got to uh, make the uh, routing companies and uh, uh, student ridership verification folks uh, pretty happy. We know that we've seen a large uptick in the acceptance rate uh, of those uh, of those technologies. Uh, certainly, a lot of folks out there uh, looking to try to do more. Uh, by communicating with parents on where's the bus, uh, where are their students uh, getting on and off the bus, uh, that whole um, uh, accountability factor. You know, Ryan, I know I was looking at a wire report. Aro Murari Acevedo wrote um, a teen sentenced to 25 years for attempted murder in Maryland, uh, attempted to get on the bus with a handgun and point it not only at the school bus driver and the aide, but other students and was basically pled guilty to first degree murder attempted, right? It, luckily no one died, but clearly a heinous crime being a, a gun on a school bus. And now we've got really younger people doing this sort of thing. And I know we're covering assault and violence um, and clearly, again, a great use of video security systems, catching all of this unfolding and using it as evidence in this kind of heinous crime. Um, you know, thank God that the school bus driver and the aide and the students weren't killed, but that is, uh, that is something to keep vigilant guys, the uh, gun violence and student violence. And so early in the year, nonetheless, less. I mean, this story was again, carry through from previous, but mm. still, I think it's very, very relevant to all you out there in the nation. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's interesting, uh, Chicago transit authority last week, uh, they announced that they're deploying a new AI based gun detection solution. Uh, so this, this is transit buses and this is in Chicago. Uh, but it's some, it's a trend that we've been following, uh, certainly, Heretofore, um, from talking with some of our law enforcement experts, uh, the, the AI gun detection uh, solution wasn't where it needed to be um, for school busing. But obviously here, and that was probably a conversation, a couple conversations I had last year. Well, a year later, here we go. We have one of the largest transit authorities in the nation that's deploying this. And we've been talking about this, you know, when we're – with back to school, we're also seeing a lot of school districts that are implementing uh, metal detectors. Broward County Public Schools in Florida, one of those uh, that just implemented for this school year. And we actually are working on an article right now uh, that's looking at this issue amid this rash of violence um, on the school buses. And I was mentioning that, you know, talking about the driver shortage earlier, we've seen parents boarding the bus and f physically confronting the bus driver because the bus was late or the bus didn't show up. And a lot of those, like what happened in Jefferson County, Kentucky last year, tied to the driver shortage. And so we were, we, before we saw maybe some parents get, uh, bully their way on the bus, which is illegal. That's against the law everywhere. Um, only authorized people, school staff, students um, are allowed on the school bus. But you know, we, before Tony, we would see these parents be mad because of bullying. Their, their child was bullied by another student on the bus, or perhaps something happened with the bus driver with that student. Now it's we're seeing over and over again these cases of parents irate because the bus didn't show up or it was late. Um, and, you know, that's... That's adding to the behavior issues that student transporters have already been dealing with. And we've been hearing about this uptick in student behavior issues on, on the school bus, especially ever since we've come back from COVID-19. So, uh, you know, certainly from a standpoint of, of, you know, also school shootings is on the on the increase and has been over the last couple of decades. We're just seeing more and more of those in communities. So certainly from a metal detection standpoint at the school districts, uh, they're, they're adding these. And, you know, I, I think back to like Detroit public schools was one of the first, uh, many years ago, uh, to, to do that. And certainly in some of these places where we've seen these horrific school shootings, uh, but it's now becoming almost like a proactive measure 
but you can't have metal detectors on the school bus. So it, it harkens back to uh, STN Expo East back in June when we were in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I was uh, facilitating an AI discussion, and we were talking about the different elements of AI-enabled, you know, which is basically software uh, that is enabling um, certain tasks to, to be handled, uh, maybe independent or in, in concert with a human being, but not taking over, right? Um, and we're seeing that in a lot of different areas. But one of my panelists, Herbert Bird, um, who's the Assistant Director of Transportation at Chesapeake Public Schools in Virginia, he was mentioning that he had heard about AI-enabled software for weapon detection. And that was something he was looking forward to and looking at. And again, speaking with the law enforcement folks and even speaking with some of the video uh, folks that we know, um, really wasn't ready for prime time. But uh, maybe we're going to see more of this now that Chicago Transit Authority um, is is implementing this. And um, we'll have to see how that, that goes, um, right? But this definitely could have some implications for student transporters. Yeah, more provocative parent behavior is definitely on the rise. I mean, I talked about it at the Transportation Director Summit. We talk about kind of those top challenges and behavior issues and assault, again, high on the list. And and when we talk about it in jest, it's kind of like, yeah, you deal with the students and you have recourse, but dealing with the parents, you don't always have recourse, right? And and. Emotions run hot and they're hot under the collar about numerous things, uh, especially when you're dealing with their children. I know as a parent, you know, you want to protect your kids um, and, and they may have some grievance and airing it out against the driver or the aide in the moment feels right. But man, I'm sure they regret it later because it's just the wrong person to be barking at. And, and those people are working hard and they don't deserve the brunt uh, of that kind of uh, behavior or valet language or assault or whatever these people are doing, throwing hot water on them. I, do you see an arrangement of different weird things that people do? And it just boggles my mind. But, you know, a lot of crazy out there, Ryan, sometimes. Absolutely. And, and again, this is against the law. So these parents find out the hard way. But that in, in the moment, you know, that that doesn't help the school bus driver out any. And back to the school bus driver shortage. One of the main reasons why we're, aside from pay, of course, um, pay always is is at the forefront of this conversation uh, when you're talking about school bus driver shortages and staff shortages in general. Uh, but um, when you're looking at the behavior that's being cited over and over again as one of the top reasons, if not the top reason, why school bus drivers are leaving the job. And so you can have all the great culture you want. You could be paying the school bus drivers 30, 35 bucks an hour, but they don't want to be dealing with um, these behavior issues when it's not accepted or not acceptable in the classroom. Although we see some egregious um, examples, um, videos of some of these, some of these things that are happening in the classrooms. I mean, stay off, stay off X, formerly known as Twitter, if you don't want to see some of that stuff. Cause I mean, I, there's just way too many of, of those, uh, uh, incidences as well. But certainly when the school bus is not supported or, or staff feels that the school bus is not supported by school administration, like they, they support the classroom, then we're going to, we're going to lose employees. We're going to lose really good employees. Uh, and, uh, so that's something that certainly all you leaders out there, uh, working with your, your school administrations, your school boards, your superintendents, just keep preaching the importance of transportation, be involved, be part of that discussion so that the stakeholders buy in to the importance, uh, of school buses, and truly view them as an extension of the classroom uh, so that they can provide that support and, and hold people accountable and get it out there to the community that, hey, this, this kind of behavior is just not acceptable. Yeah. Other headlines, Ryan, I know last week we got a press release from Bluebird. They delivered 2000th electric school bus. So that's quite a milestone uh, for a 2000 delivery. So, you know, we thought about this at the beginning, electric school buses, would it take? We're still seeing it kind of proliferate uh, funding still into the future. A few more years of clean school bus funding. Uh, we don't know long-term what the implications are. Obviously uh, in your September issue, 
article and in previous issues, we, we prognosticate about this somewhat and it's just what's going to happen. And I think there were a few months away from knowing who the next president of the United States is going to be. And it's, uh, it's going to really impact the school bus industry, at least in our opinion. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we have some more editorial coming up later this fall that's looking at, you know, batteries. There's a lot of questions on that. Um, that's, a, that's a very big aspect of electrification. And, and, and again, I, I mentioned this before earlier uh, this summer, but we had a great presentation by uh, Vishant Katari at uh, World Resources Institute, their electric school bus initiative, talking about batteries, talking about the, the responsible sourcing those uh, those critical elements that make up these batteries, um, whether it be the lithium ion, nickel, manganese, cobalt, uh, which we've seen really um, power most electric school buses. And now we're transitioning to lithium iron phosphate, another chemistry under the lithium ion umbrella, which is more stable. Phosphate? Yeah, LFP or LIFEPO too, LIFEPO4. It's another acronym. But, you know, where it's higher density, uh, no thermal runaways, um, but looking at the, the, the chemistry of that and what co- countries are owning the, really those resources. So it's really interesting. We're gonna, and, and then looking at you know, second, third, fourth life of batteries, really interesting stuff. Um, you know, and then the larger conversation about fuel management um, as, as well. So all of this stuff is, is kind of coalescing into, you know, this path to 2027 uh, that we're looking at with the, the new EPA phase three um, uh, GHG rule that goes into effect in a couple of years. Folks are just really trying to figure out what does this mean to, to us amid, you know, less propane being available, less diesel that's going to be available. Um, obviously, everything you know is pushing toward electric, but as we know, it's just not uh, working for everybody yet. It's going to take some time. Uh, a lot of infrastructure, um, new infrastructure going in. Saw that the Biden administration announced the latest money that's gone out uh, to uh, develop uh, the infrastructure from uh, that same bipartisan infrastructure plan that that set up a clean school bus. So. A lot's lots rolling out there, um, but a lot still needs to be figured out. Great update, Ryan. All right, guys, before we get to our interview, we have a quick message. Hey, guys, what do software, hardware, and safety have in common? One word, TransFinder. At the STN Expo in Reno, TransFinder won three Innovation Choice Awards voted on by STN Expo attendees for best software, best hardware, best safety technology. TransFinder's RouteFinder plus routing solution and apps, StopFinder and WaveFinder are well known in the industry. Not everyone realizes TransFinder provides hardware like card readers, tablets, and mounts. And as for safety, Patrol Finder for schools is TransFinder's latest solution designed to make buses and campuses safer. TransFinder's president and CEO, Antonio Civitella, said the recognition means so much because it's voted on by SCN Expo attendees. Civitella said, we know a lot is riding on TransFinder because a lot is riding on those yellow buses that travel through our communities. TransFinder must continue to innovate as more is being expected of transportation departments from district leadership as well as parents. Learn more at transfinder.com. That's transfinder.com. Hello, Nation. Taylor Ekbatani here. I am joined by our September 2024 cover star. <laughs> so we have Ron Johnson, the Director of Support Operations for Indian Prairie School District number 204 in Illinois with us today. So welcome. Thanks for jumping on. Oh, absolutely. A pleasure to be here. So by the time you guys are listening to this, the September issue should be out. So you should see Ron's beautiful face gracing our cover. But uh, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with Ron, Ron, can you kind of provide our listeners a little bit about you, your background, how you got started in school transportation? Yeah, absolutely. So Indian Prairie School District 204 is the fourth largest school district in the state of Illinois. We have roughly 26, 27,000 students across 35 uh, buildings. We run roughly a little over 1,100 routes a day, 
260 drivers. So it's a pretty big operation. I also oversee food services. So there's some there's some overlap within our operation side of uh, the student support side of things. So it's good that I have 25 years of experience in logistics, came from the private sector with one of the larger logistics companies in the world, uh, got involved. My wife is a math teacher. She said, you really need to get out of the corporate environment, get into education. I think your skill set would be very well fit on the business side of a school district. Um, went back to school, got a master's in secondary education, did some student teaching in a business education department, and then an opportunity for a transportation and purchasing director position to open up. Was hired for that, did that for five years, and then we moved to the area that, you know, Naperville area. And when this job opened up, I applied and I've been here for about eight years. So if you add all that together, it's about 25 years of transportation and logistics experience. And then the past 15 or 16 have been in schools. The The upfront part was in specialized transportation. That's pretty much where, where the bread and butter of my experience in schools were. And then I was able to bring that experience into Indian Prairie. Uh, making sure that students that have any type of special accommodation or a special need and then grow into the regular general education routing, which fit with my experience with logistics in the private sector. So I was able to hit the door running, incorporate some policies and procedures with the district to make things a little bit better. And I'm sure we can talk about those throughout the uh, podcast here. Yeah, that's that's exciting. So does your wife, is she teaching at Indian Prairie as well? No, she's she's a math teacher. She's been a math teacher for going about about fifteen years. Um, prior to us to starting having kids, uh, she was at middle school and high school uh, in Elmhurst, Illinois, and Park Ridge, Illinois. And what she decided to do is when we started to have kids, was stay home, raise them as they start going off to school. So now she's starting to get back into that that itch of getting back into the classroom. And I believe I'm guessing in the next year or two she'll be. Uh, back in the classroom teaching. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. You got to have both perspectives at home, right? The In the classroom and in transportation. So I'm sure you guys yeah, are talking shop when you probably shouldn't be at, at, yeah, at the dinner there's, table. There's definitely some healthy <laughs> debates on school <laughs> district operations uh, from a teacher's perspective and from a business perspective. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned uh, transporting students with special needs. What does that kind of look like at your school district? Do you guys have a large population of students with disabilities? Yeah, we there's a, there's a decent population. Not all qualify for transportation as a related service. A uh, little over a thousand students uh, with special needs that, uh, whether it's defined in an IEP or a 504 plan, that they require some type of transportation service as a related service. Um, a lot of our vehicles, we have alternative vehicles, so minivans. We not it's just not small bus. If we are, you know, we got kind of go through the IDEA scale of, you know, is the student eligible for regular ed transportation? Can they walk to a bus stop? And then we kind of escalate, you know, from a least restrictive environment to a most restrictive environment, which we say a most restrictive is solo route with an aid, nurse, some other type of accommodation. Um, least restrictive is you can walk or bike to school, mm-hmm. then progressively, depending on eligibility. Um, we have a great support, student support team uh, throughout the district, whether it's a student support coordinator at the building level, a district administrator, um, assistant soup of student services. And we work really well together to make sure that we get a right fit for the student. It's in it. You know, when you're like I said, we have 27,000 students and a little over a thousand are special needs routed. Um, You know, individual gets very time consuming. But if you get the right fit, then the experience and the service is provided uh, to help the student start their day off right and end their day off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. Okay, And I believe you guys started school this this week that we're recording. Uh, last Thursday, the 27th okay. is our first day of school. As you know, we've incorporated some technologies over the past five, six years that have progressively improved our operations, whether it was with routing itself, information for parents, information for schools, information for our dispatch team, information for our drivers. And each year it gets better and better and better. You know, I track our first few days of on-time network, you know, getting getting kids picked up on time and taken to the schools and then picked up at the schools and then taken back to their bus stop in the afternoon. 
Uh, typically, the first few days were anywhere from 83 to 86 percent on time. Those first two days, as drivers are really getting used to the traffic and the school traffic and students, um, because we do dry runs. Well, you know, the dry runs don't have all that additional uh, pedestrian traffic and vehicle traffic on the road. So they get, you know, it gets bogged down. So it, it drops that on time network a little bit. But this year we're 91.5%, wow. which we're static about. We we are staffed, which is going to be a, <laughs> a surprise to hear by many listening to this podcast. Uh, I mean, we are fully staffed. We have a standby driver crew. Our dispatchers are staffed. Our mechanics are staffed. Wow. Um, it's the first time in probably the 15 years of experience that that we're we're flush and we have some standbys available to cover absenteeism medical those types of deals but it's a it's a good position to be in and the results are showing with a almost 90 92 percent on time network yeah that's awesome so can you share your secret sauce for the listeners well, well, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know if i want to because then they may, they may uh some of our drivers might go somewhere else no i'm kidding uh honestly it we we have a wonderful relationship with the drivers they i'm always in dispatch i am talking to them i know about their families they know about my family it's a it's it's a relationship you can't treat them as hired help and if you treat them as hired help that's how they're going to act right they're going to Okay, I, well, I can make a p- couple extra dollars over here per hour. They're going to move around. We all know that the pool of school bus drivers isn't changing. It has not grown. We're all fishing and, and swimming in that same pool trying to get those same drivers. So relationships and treating people with respect, making sure that it's a personal thing. It's not just you come to work, you drive a bus, you go home, you know people by name. That's important. Also listening to some of their feedback. If they come to you and say, I have a better idea on my route path, you listen to them and you take that, you research it, you get back to them, whether you implement it or you provide the reasons why you don't, right? That gains the credibility, that gains the respect. It makes them feel part of the team instead of just a paycheck at the end of the week, right? Um, We provide technologies that some of our surrounding school districts don't. They're starting to grow that. So our fastest gazelle getting chased by the lion strategy is, you know, they're starting to catch up because now people see, wow, Indian Prairie 204 is doing it and it's really improving their results in operation. We need that as well. So our state board of education in the state of Illinois has budgeted funding for, you know, some technologies on school buses, which is making it more available to school districts that it may not have been in the past. So it's it's a it's a good deal with the annual transportation claim here in the state of Illinois that makes that that expense eligible mm-hmm. and bearable. Great thoughts, guys. Let's take a quick break. Hey, guys, do you know who Zenobi is? You may know them from their EV fleet space work where the company supports over twelve hundred electric buses and shuttles worldwide. U.S. EV fleet operations are now underway, particularly with school bus fleets. But did you know Zenobi is also the global leader in Second Life EV batteries? In fact, they're the only fleet electrification company in North America with a Second Life solution for EV fleet batteries. Zenobi is now identifying EV fleets and Second Life partners and projects. Visit Zenobi.com slash north dash america for more that's www.zenobe.com slash north dash america let's dive into the technology because the september issue was the technology issue Um, it focused on tech super users which is where you came in to grace our cover Um, (laughs) i don't know this mug i don't know maybe we should get somebody (laughs) um but yeah kind of talk about that a little bit so what technologies did you guys focus on adopting and how has that really helped streamline your operations Yeah, about six years ago, um, our superintendent was at a conference and she heard a presentation about a bus tracking app. And she came back from the conference, as most superintendents do, and they ask their their directors of, hey, what can you do to put this in our district? And at that time, we had, you know, GPS as a standalone plug in device on a bus. And it was fairly reliable until you change buses to cover routes. Right. Then you lose some data. 
So we we looked into it. Our routing system is the Tyler Technologies Versatrans routing system, and we wanted to enhance on and grow that system instead of trying to piecemeal multiple systems together. Then if something fails or doesn't work, you got finger pointing and people not owning what they can maybe fix, right? Because then it becomes a defensive thing as opposed to, hey, you just need to change this setting or, hey, I need to get on the server to do this. So we wanted to kind of see if we can utilize our routing suite that we had already purchased and already in place and really just grow that for more opportunities for information, better data gathering. So we reached out to Tyler Technologies and asked them, here's what we want to do. In the end, we want to have potentially a parent tracking app, but I think there's more to it than just giving a tool to the parents. I think we can really justify the time, effort, and expense if we bring in all stakeholder groups, our dispatchers, our drivers, our management, our district staff, our schools, our school office staff, um, and, and parents as well, and seeing if we can incorporate a technology solution that gives everybody a benefit to the system. That's when they were first rolling out this tablet called the Tyler Drive. It was it was a very bulky, rugged tablet that had software, had an app on it that interacted and they were starting to come out with that. And we were asked, well, do you wanna be one of our earlier adopters? And I said, yeah, let's, why don't you come in, show us a demo of what it can do. And it's exactly the vision I kind of had in my mind. If that existed, that's the way you need to go is have the tablet being on the bus, providing a resource for the driver, a tool for the driver. And that tablet itself is your GPS unit. That is what's telling this, all the other systems that would interact where the bus is at and not necessarily a hardwired device. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, we piloted a small part of our fleet, about 30, 40 buses, uh, got some of our more technologically advanced drivers on board that, hey, let's let's pilot this, see how it works. So we started off with that, and it went, went really well. We were getting good information, good data back to our servers, good information in our all of our online systems, good information going to our schools with what's called a system called a rival board, good information being displayed in our dispatch center with a system called the electronic rollout, which shows all the drivers and when they should be rolling out. And when they do leave the geofence of each bus, we have three dispatch centers, three bus barns. When they roll out, if they fall off the board because they're on the road when they should have been. And if, if it turns red, they haven't left. And it gives our dispatchers an opportunity to call the driver to see, hey, did it just not pick up out of the geofence? Or are you truly not at work and we have to cover that route? Um, so it just improved our dispatch operations. And then after all those things were in place, we trained school staff, we trained our dispatchers, we trained our district office staff on how to use that information. We trained our drivers on how to use the tablets and what the purpose of it is. Then we put a small pilot group together for the bus tracking app called MyStop. Mm -hmm. Got feedback, provided feedback with Tyler Technologies. They were extremely responsive on not only the customer support side, but with the developers team, the developers um, changing things to kind of make it fit like, hey, with this new technology with Tyler Drive interacting with an established flagship product like Versatrans, here's what my stop should look like. And they were able to make some changes. And now we've been on my stop for three years. So the calls into our dispatch center have, I mean, diminished to just a handful a day instead of, which helps our dispatchers do their job stay stay in the office doing dispatch, handing keys out, dispatching drivers, covering routes if a driver calls in sick or is not available to come into work um, and do that part of the job instead of answering the where's the bus phone calls because mm -hmm. they can call their school office, school office has access to the GPS, they can call my staff, get access to it, or the parent can look it up in the my stop app. And the only time that they should be calling is if that data is not showing in any of those systems. So that's very far and few between. We get about a 99% GPS visibility rate. So there's just the one off that either the, the tablet itself isn't the cell, not connected to the cell tower due to a bad signal. And then we talk about, you know, LTE boosters being installed on buses and stuff like that. But those are the technology pieces that we've incorporated over the past six years and cautiously, you know, moved into the 21st century by making sure each system that we turned on or enabled or incorporated was able to be supported, was able to be used by our staff safely and securely, 
and made sure that we had uh, protocols and procedures in place on what the information is going to be used for, how it's going to be used. Um, it's not like you know, in the sense of a my stop bus tracking app. Just you know, it's not to sit in your house waiting till you see it on the app and then run out to the bus stop. That's extremely unsafe. Um, and it's also if you miss the bus, it's not used to run to the next bus stop to catch it because you see it in the app moving. Again, extremely unsafe. So. You know, we had to put those protocols and procedures, communicate those clearly before we went full on. And that was each step of the way. Right. And I know uh, with the tablets, I don't want to rehash the September issue too much, (laughs) but you guys actually have, you know, real emergency type situations in which you were able to use the tablets when you lost, I would think, 25 percent of your driver's driving force. Yeah. And and with the tablet itself, once we got the drivers on board, we got all drivers fully on board about five years ago. And using the tablet to cover driver shortages was a lifesaver. Um, we were using the tablets to combine anywhere from 30 to 50 driver route packages a day. We run a three tier system. So that's anywhere from 90 to 150 routes that we were collapsing onto other routes and still maintaining an over 90% on-time network because we were able to look at where routing and drivers were, add a few stops to their their packages, split up multiple stops on the routes. The tablets optimize that route, and it's it, it just runs like that was that driver's planned day. Now, the 5 a.m., chopping those routes, adding stops, and because it's not the same every day, unfortunately, because the driver calls in, then you're covering that route, the next one. Could, and it was a moving puzzle, moving puzzle target. But our dispatchers were amazing with it. They, After a few days of doing it, they had it locked down. They knew exactly how to plan it then. If they knew drivers weren't coming in the next day, they knew how to chop those routes out and only focus on the one or two that were at more absenteeism-based. Our shortages didn't hinder our operations solely because of the technology on the bus and the tools available to the dispatchers and the tool available to the driver, because now they don't have six route sheets in their hand saying, oh, I'm only covering these two stops, but I'm going to complete my planned route first, then I'm going to go do this. The tablet has the ability to add those two stops on and then optimize the route as if it was on your route sheet. So the drivers were able to do that themselves by just saying, Hey, Ron, I need you to cover first two stops on Cloud Elementary Route 1, add them to your route package, and they add them, they modify the stop, they modify the route, and it reroutes it to be a, an optimized route while maintaining all of our roadway restrictions, right side only loading, all of all the criteria, safety criteria that we put into the base map, it maintains all of that. So it's not like Google Maps where it's just getting you to the most efficient fastest route, it's still maintaining all of our routing practices and procedures, safety protocols, uh, which is invaluable Mm -hmm. for for a driver. And I don't, I don't want to butcher the numbers off the top of my head. I know you probably know them, but when you first got the tablets, you were actually able to cut the number of routes that you needed overall for your district. Yeah. And there was a lot of just, I, what I brought from the private sector is just efficiencies and optimization. So we were putting about, when I was first hired here a little over eight years ago, um, 315 drivers on the road every day. Today, we're putting 236. That is the technology, the information that we were available, what is needed, and then looking at our routing practices as well. We had some of our principals wanted drivers sitting at their building for 15 minutes prior to the bell. And I'm like, that's a route. No, we're going we're gonna to have you rolling in before the bell but I can cover another route where I can collapse packages. So we were able to, my, my first year here, I get called from our dispatch manager saying, we're 50 drivers short after route bids. And then that's when I really had to dig into the fleet schedule to see how many routes do we can we run? What are we going to smash together? And I saw some of those inefficiencies that we immediately covered 30 drivers just because of that. Now we're short 20, and this is back in the route sheet days, and I was like, all right, now let's get some of our mechanics on the road, our office staff, our safety manager, our road supervisors. Now everybody's driving where we have nobody on the support end of our operation. The next year is when we started incorporating Tyler Drive. That year we were down to 30 drivers short total. We we're able to cover that with office staff standbys and recruitment efforts over time 
And then the next year we were on Tyler drive, then it was, you know, just a learning curve on how to collapse those driver shortages. That was a driver shortage of 25. Then each year it was floating around 20 to 30. And then this year we're like, we did a lot of recruitment efforts, a lot of what we call big bus, no fuss events, where we do pop-up events. We have people come look at a bus and you can drive it around in one of our school parking lots with no, with one of our driver trainers and just looking to see, hey, is this hard? It's not that hard. We incorporated um, child ride along programs. So if you have somebody that's not an infant, but like a two year old that's not in school, but the only reason why you're not working is because you need daycare. We'll bring your child on the bus with you while you run your route then. Just hmm. that's not a problem. So that helped with some recruitment efforts. We got some of our local community members that were more than willing to do that. Um, the tablets, we take those to the job fairs and say, hey, look, like it just follow what this is telling you. Turn left here, turn right here, stop ahead. Yeah. Student information at your fingertips. You can see if somebody's on your bus that's not supposed to be and at the end of the route, you're like, well, where are you supposed to be? It's no longer him trying to, the student trying to figure it out. You now look it up and say, oh, you were supposed to be on route seven. Let me take you to your bus stop because now you can just add that bus stop to your route and get them there. Uh, where before we were taking them back to the school, parents were being called, parents were coming and picking up kids. Um, some of that still happens, but it's more on the extreme side where kids, they're not eligible for bus service, jumps on a bus, doesn't mm. get off at a bus stop. It's like, well, you shouldn't have been here anyway. We're taking you back to school kind of thing. Um, get some of those sneaky, sneaky kids doing that. But but that's kind of the gist of the progression of our technology use. And um, we did have the incident you referred to, uh, an emergency situation where we lost 25 percent of our driver workforce because of a uh, law enforcement lockdown area uh, perimeter and our drivers being pulled out of their buses. They were staged, it was right at high school dismissal time. The high school is the first in the PM on a three tier system. And it was a shooting incident, not at one of our buildings, but it was in the community while we were getting ready. So the police set a perimeter because they couldn't locate the suspects. And then we had to figure out how to run the rest of the, the area. We had to fi figure out how to run. Okay, all right, we have 34 other buildings that still have transportation service. One just take was taken out of service. Hopefully the the incident gets resolved quickly so that when we get to our middle school tier, which is the second tier, those drivers are released. They go to their middle schools and run. They weren't. <laughs> it was a three hour event that took 25 percent of our 260 drivers off the road. Right. And then now we're chopping up routes, telling drivers to cover routes. Uh, radio call out, we need this covered. And the tablets, the drivers are just adding it and running it and adding it and running it, doubling back. So if we had, you know, only half the drivers at one of our middle schools, they would take, you know, those half and then come back, take the other half. Um, but they were able to do that with the tablets. Um, they were able to just add that route to the tablet, run it as if they were the driver. Instead of running three hours late, we had, and, and on a normal basis, we would drop our last student off around 3 or 4.30, 4.45. The last one was dropped off between 5.30 and 6 o'clock. So you're, you're talking a major incident that shut down an area of our school district that affected all the pairings with those 25% of those drivers, like 50-something drivers. And we ran an hour late on not everything, right. just the ones that those drivers were paired with. Um, it was It was... Definitely mass controlled chaos. <laughs> uh, you know, you could not get through on the radio because it, the, the radio traffic was so heavy. We had to use some of the messaging functionalities of the tablet, which is messaging drivers. We need, uh, you know, one of our uh, skull and route two covered. Somebody would pick it up, confirm that they got it covered, add it to their route, go to skull and middle school, run that route. So we, we were able to use some of those things that uh, just due to that tablet that that made us get through that day, even though it wasn't an incident that affected that uh, was directly re related to our school buildings. The incident did happen right outside one of our elementary buildings uh, down the street from it, uh, which put that into a secure building and then just put the whole area about a mile away from that that incident, a mile perimeter, which shut down six of our buildings. They had to go in and it was just yeah, that was a day. <laughs> <laughs> But you had technology to help you out. It did. I mean, without it, I mean, we'd probably still be dropping off kids. And that <laughs> happened last April. <laughs> 
Uh, well, as we wrap up here, Ron, are there any big initiatives that you're focusing on for this school year? We are. We have two exciting things. We we were eligible for a Volkswagen um, electric bus grant, one of the Volkswagen uh, funding that became available. So we have that on order. Uh, hoping to see that, you know, from what we talked to some of our neighboring districts that got it, it's a pretty slow turnaround. So we're hoping to see that this year so we can pilot one. Electric. See how it works. Yeah, electric vehicle. Okay. You have electric bus. We want to pilot it. We don't want to just like swap out the whole fleet and then we have issues, right? We want to pilot one, see how it goes, and then grow the pilot into a little bit more of a full-blown fleet. The the second thing is, is uh, student scanning. We're piloting student scanning at our, two of our elementary buildings right now. Uh, we started that for day one. Uh, it works direct. Again, it's another add-on to our Tyler Technologies routing system. It's a RFID card, almost like a student ID. We have it on a bag tag for the backpack, and the students are just you know, scanning on the buses and it tells the tablet where they belong on that bus. Some of our drivers and building staff were able to catch students that were getting on the wrong bus, which if you have a kindergartner getting on the wrong bus, when their assigned bus goes to the bus stop and the parents waiting there, <laughs> the kid doesn't get off. They, they get a little bit worried. And then now we're, we're searching for students because of this technology. It tells them it gives an error message on the tablet itself that says, no, 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 you're not on this bus. You're on another bus. So we were able to catch those. So we're piloting that just to see is it beneficial? Is it something that we should grow across our all of our schools? Not only taking just it from a bus piece, but a student, you know, making it like the student ID. So it's your bus pass, it's your lunch card, it's your Chromebook login, it's your activity, sports pass, athletic pass. So building it an all-inclusive card so that, you know, because students don't want to wear anything around their neck. Right. So then the cards, they don't, they don't have them on them. Well, we're, we would make this card your student ID with all these things of your school day and incorporate that into the card so that you have to have it on there to have a, an easier school day or else you're going to be typing in things and do a point of service machine in the cafeteria. You're going to take forever loading the bus. You're not going to be able to go to the LMC and check out books. You're not going to be able to <laughs> log into your Chromebook just by scanning a QR code. So we would make it not, you know, hey, you need to wear your student ID or else it's a Hey, you kind of have to have this thing in order to access systems. And yeah, more ease, easier for him. Easier. So we want to grow it into that. So we're stepping in to seeing is the student scanning on buses, but then having conversations with our curriculum and student service folks. Hey, what can you use it for? Special education routing and collecting attendance for Medicaid reimbursements. Um, so we're really, again, going back to our roots of how we incorporated Tyler Drive tablets coming back to that, restarting that same thing, involving the stakeholder groups. How can you use this information? If we grew it, getting with our data services teams, what it would look like for Chromebook logins, you know, and just really, just really having conversations and cross operations and cross de department support and involving them in how we can make it successful. Not just, oh, I lost my card. Well, those cards are two bucks each, right? I mean, you know, and not making it a discipline. You, if you don't have your ID on your discipline, which then that's how we we roped in our campus security coordinator for the district is, hey, students that are identified with a student ID in the building, we know they should be there. So if somebody tries to sneak in to do something, they won't have an ID. Somebody puts eyes on them. Right. And it could either be, hey, you're not supposed to be here or you just lost your ID. You don't have your school, your school lanyard on. So it's it's attacking it from all the angles, stepping through it cautiously, getting the right solution, making sure it's something that can be sustained indefinitely as opposed to hey this works but then next year it's gone like many pilot programs in school districts it, it, that's what happens is the interest is lost it's not valuable it people thought it was a great idea then it falls off to the wayside so we're trying not to let that happen if we decide to continue the pilot for student scanning yeah yeah that's huge too involving all your stakeholders and seeing where else you know the technology could be used in the school so it's not just siloed right. to transportation operations 
Yeah, I mean, I, I may be on the cover of a magazine, but I definitely am not the smartest person in the room, right? <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, Ron, with that, I want to encourage everyone to go check out the September issue. You can read about Ron and our other tech super users in that issue. But thank you so much, Ron, for jumping on the podcast. And thanks for sharing your insight. I'm happy you had a great first day of school. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have a good one. A special thanks to Ron, Ryan, and Taylor for jumping on the podcast today. We really appreciate them. And we also appreciate our sponsors, TransFinder, the Propane Education Research Council, and Zenobi. Guys, don't forget, you can visit stmonline.com for all the latest news and analysis about the school transportation industry. Make sure and register today as well for the TSD Conference, the ultimate in special needs needs training. It is available right now with our early bird discount to save $100 off. It's November 7th through the 12th down in Dallas, Texas, suburb of Frisco. Can't wait to see you down there. The website's got all the details, agenda, keynotes, networking events, trade show, got everything you need. You want some hands-on training? We got you covered. You want to talk about legal topics? We got that too. Latest trends on behavior? Yep. That's there at the TSD Conference. Make sure you check it out, tsdconference.com. Guys, don't forget, September issue is out on the STN website as well. Go click on that magazine tab or click it on the right sidebar of the website. September issue, read it now, all about technology, technology trends, everything happening in your world in school transportation. Definitely, we got you covered, Nation. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to pods. Nation, we love you. We'll see you next week.